Hi, my name is Eva Pavon, and I am the Master Gardener Coordinator and Residential Horticulture Agent. And with me is also Krista Stum, and she is the Natural um, Resource Agent. Um, we um, both work for the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Osceola County. And today we're going to be presenting about compost. And I will say in advance that I am new at compost and I am learning as we speak and as I'm presenting to you guys, I just had my leader first compost at home. So bear with me and I may not have answers some for some of your questions if you are more advanced gardeners, but I promise you I will get back to you, okay? Um, but if you have any questions, we put it in the chat and I'm sure um, Valerie or Krista can see those questions and um, keep track of them, okay? So what is compost is uh, partially decomposed remains of plants or other organic materials. When you're composting is that you control, you have a control environment when these organisms are, or organic materials are, they're in their process of decomposition, okay? And that is that happened because there are some microorganisms, they are working in there to help this process to happen. This happen in nature and also happen because you have it at home. And the humus is the final stage of that decomposition of the compost. And it looks almost like soil. So it is very, um, it's normally very dark and it's very thin. So you can, um, it looks like, like regular soil, okay? So biological decomposition of organic waste by bacteria, fungi, worms, and other organisms in an aerobic conditions. And as a result, it's going to look like that friable, friable, partially decomposed organic matter. And that's what I was talking about, that dark um, material. Why we should compost? Um, because we have so much recycled jars um, and also kitchen waste. Um, every time I'm cooking, um, like I told you, I started with a small um, compost bin in my kitchen. And I was surprised how fast I can feel that um, from my um, kitchen um, waste um, because I, we do a lot of salads and we eat a lot of um, fruits and vegetables and we do a lot of different smoothies and things. And you you can accumulate a lot of that kitchen waste. And also yesterday or last weekend, I'm sorry, I was working in my yard and I decided to do some pruning and, you know, do some things here and there. And right there is another um, material that we can compose. Typically what I do, I don't even um, take it to the, let the, the, the garbage um, companies take it. What I do is I probably, I normally just put um, those branches that I prune out of my plants behind other bushes and other things um, and let it decompose there. Um, also improve um, soil qualities. Um, like fertilized fer fertility, the water holding, aeration, food source um, for my microbes. So it helps with that part of the soil. Reduce waste in the landfills. So if you think about it, you know, if we want, if we want, um, we don't want more landfills to be built, we need to do our part. Also improve um, plant growth and has a slow release nutrients when is there. So 20% of the trash going into the landfill is actually landscaping trash. So think about that. Um, and sometimes depending where we are, especially if it's in the summer when everybody wants to do their yards and everybody's pruning, can be up to 40, uh, sorry, 80% of the waste that goes into the landfills can be um, trash. And if in Florida it's actually legal to put your yard waste with your regular trash. So that's why you have to put in a separate pile, but still it's things that go to the landfill. And some um, counties and cities do create some compost from that. So what can be um, composted? Leaves and yard waste. So you're pruning in your yard, you're doing some cleaning, you're pulling um, some old plants, you know, um, some perennials, you're doing some cleaning in the, in the yard that can fit there. Grass and long clippings. So if 
normally what we do in our house is that we let the mower do the mulching and that goes directly to the lawn. But if you want to uh, bag it, then you can compost that. You can use it as a mulch and you can put it in on, or you can put it in a compost pile. You can do also uh, wood chips or salt dusk, kitchen waste, and manure. But very important with the manure, it should be um, from animals that eat plants, such as rabbit, cows, and horses. Okay, so those those sources are very very important, or very um, and they're e easy to find. Um, one thing I will tell you. Um, if you're only using manure, and this is a lot of controversy about it, and people go back and forth about it, um, it should be in the compost pile at least for six months um, because they eat grasses. So if sometimes if you put it directly in your garden, you can have more weeds and and you can have some problems also with bacteria. So you want to make sure is um, is being processed at least for six months. Okay. What not to compost? Human or pet waste. Okay, so very important. Chemical treated wood products, especially if you're doing compost because you want your garden to be more um, organic, um, so you don't want to have that. Um, one of the issues that we have with the compost from the different cities and um, counties is that they made that compost with the products that or the degree that the landscapers bring to the landfill. So sometimes it's hard to know if um, it's being treated or not. So you, you have to be careful when you get um, compost from a private or from someone. So the only way you know doesn't have any chemicals if you create your own compost, okay? You should not have meat, bones, or fatty um, food waste. Number one, we're in Florida, there is a lot of wildlife and then you're gonna have issues and it's gonna smell and your neighbors are not gonna be happy. Um, dairy products should not be compost either. Um, and diseased plants are weeds because if, there, if the compost pile doesn't reach the right temperature, then when you use that compost in your garden, you're gonna bring that disease and you're gonna bring the weeds too, okay? And then you don't want to um, bring plants that have been treated with pesticides, okay? Um, some of these can attract um, other pests, and then you can have issues with roaches or other type of insects, especially if they're close to, um, to, the, to the house. Compost elements, um, we we're going to talk about each of them a little in deep, but is moisture, aeration, the pile temperature, the particle size, and the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Moisture um, is very important because the, the microbes need some um, water or some moisture to actually um, prosper and increase in that pile. So we want to make sure that you know you, you put your, your compost close to, to a hose you know, they can be wet unless you have an open one, that when it rains, you will get the water. Um, but it, it, sometimes you have to, to water them, okay? And I, I will tell you, and I, com I will confess, the, the little compost I have in the house, um, I forgot to put some water. So it's, it's working, but it's working a little slower because I keep forgetting that I have to put some water, okay? The ideal moisture, moisture um, level is 40 to 60%. Um, compost um, should feel moist but not soggy so you don't want to have like a soup in there you just want to make sure it's, it's just moist okay um, and then the moisture as it, it will help to build your pile and check the moisture regularly so at least go once a week and make sure you know that it has enough uh, moisture and if you have one of those comp uh, compost um, beans that are plastic and you have it outside, um, it might dry really fast. So you want to make sure that the moisture levels are correct. Aeration. This helps with the uh, microbes to work efficiently. So you need to move that pile. If you have a compost bin like the one in the picture that you just move, then you just go maybe once a week and just move a little bit of the compost that they start mixing itself, okay? 
also helps um, with reduce unpleasant, unpleasant odors and um, adding, you, you can also do some aeration if you add, add more bulky items. And then if you don't have a pile or a bin like this one, you can just go with your shovel and move the compost. Um, you know, that it has some aeration and, and you're moving the, the, the material that is in there. The pile temperature is all gonna depend on the size of your pile, okay? Um, the available oxygen and the moisture content. So that is what is gonna dictate the temperature and when it's gonna reach the, the most efficient and, and the perfect temperature. Um, the perfect or the most effective is between 122 degrees to 131 degrees. And it's good if you have one of these long stem thermometers that can reach up to 160 degrees, okay? Um, if the temperature goes over 150 degrees, the organisms will die. So maybe they, some of the good things will not survive in there. Um, but then if you wanna make sure that there is no diseases or weed seeds, it needs to reach between 133 degrees and 140. One of the things I learned um, in the process of doing my own compost at home, and I, I've been listening to some of our colleagues uh, around the state, and actually even someone from out of state, is the compost is going to happen no matter what. Okay, so if you have that little pile in your garden or you have a compost bean somewhere, it's going to happen. You know, if you don't reach the, the perfect temperature or it went over 150, don't don't be discouraged just keep trying because it's going to happen it's either going to take longer or you may have to add some of the other um you know some other like grass or or some other products like uh newspaper and all this stuff the particle size um the smaller the better okay because that's what is going to happen is that it's going to um the compost is gonna be uh, ready faster, okay? So if you're putting there like branches, the branches should not be more than one quarter of an inch, okay? And if they are more than that, they're bigger than that, then you should, you know, cut them or try to um, shred them because it's not, it's gonna take longer. So again, like I said earlier, it's gonna happen no matter what, it's just, it's gonna take longer, okay? Um, so chip those small limbs and twigs and make sure that you, if you can, shred the leaves. I don't have any of this equipment, so I just put it there and let it work itself, you know, with nature. But if you have some equipment or if you have at least pruners, just make sure you cut um, any branches or anything, okay? It's very important to have the correct carbon to nitrogen ratio. Okay, and let's talk about um, that, and, and Chris is gonna talk a little more about this, the part of the process. Um, but carbon is the energy so source, okay, for the microbes, and nitrogen provides the role, uh, role building blocks for protein, so it is, it's important, this whole um, ratio. Browns are carbon and greens are nitrogen, okay? and the optimum ratio is 30 to one or less, okay? And here are some examples of the ratios that we can use for the food organic sources of um, carbon, um, pine needles. And if you look at all the different um, products that we, we can use or recommend, um, depending on, on how big is the the items is how much you need, okay? So wood chips, you need less, and you know, for newspaper, you also need, need, need less. And for the newspaper, any paper, we will recommend that you actually break it in pieces. And I can provide this uh, PowerPoint for you guys that you have the ratios um, for, your, for your purposes. Okay, so the browns, um, they do this compose slow, unless they're mixed with greens, okay? So like I said earlier, it will happen no matter what, but then if you want it to, to break down faster, you have to add some greens 
and um, so pro to provide um, some source of energy, and it should be in the top layer. If we are combining some of the, and I think I pulled the wrong public uh, PowerPoint, um, but if um, we you want to combine some of the um, greens, um, you know your ratio for um, vegetables should be five to one, and that means like your vegetables, your full, your fruits, your peels. Um, make sure that you don't add you don't add weeds. Okay, like we said before, and you know if you have any house plants, very important. Um, and I know you guys know a lot about the different invasive and the natives, and this is what is special about this group. But if you have any house plants, you have to be very careful when you put them in the pile because some of the um, house plants that are sold in the in the market they actually are invasive in the natural environment. So you need to make sure. Um, you know which house clippings, house plant clippings you're putting outside, okay? The greens, they do decompose very quick. Um, they also provide the nitrogen and food source and they are high in moisture, okay? Um, and they should be um, mixed with into the pile. All right, and I'm gonna jump in here and I am gonna talk a little bit more about what are those microbes that Ava has been referencing and other organis organisms? And she briefly touched on temperature. But the cool thing about composting and what I love to talk about it is that there are multiple systems at play here, right? And so it's all interconnected and we need to understand that if we wanna be successful or if we just wanna understand the science behind it a little bit better. So these organisms are what is driving the um, the composting and they could be microorganism microbes such as bacteria or fungi but also we have earthworms and other anthropods like insects mites millipedes centipedes all of these are helping to break down that food waste and the yard waste and turn it into composting next slide please and throughout the process, there are multiple phases. So if we're looking at a temperature-driven composting, you can break it up into about three or four phases, depending on how you um, categorize the last phase. And so stick with me here, but because it's important that we understand these phases so that we understand what microbes are at play and when. So when we start out with our composting, it, we're in a mesophilic range or a moderate temperature phase. And of course it depends on many different factors, but typically this lasts for a couple of days. And as the microbes do their job, the compost starts to heat up more and more. And then we're reaching a thermophilic or a high temperature phase. And this can last a few days to several months. Like I said, it does depend. Then finally, after you reach that peak, we'll start to cool down and reach a cooling phase followed by a curing phase that can last for several months. Next slide. And this is one of those graphs just blown up a little bit more so you can see how that curve works and how steep of an uphill it is during that first mesophilic range. And then once it reaches about 40 C, which is 105 Fahrenheit or higher, if you remember Ava said what the ideal range was, we're in the thermophilic range where we're then able to break down some proteins and fats and some cellulose. And we then have to return to an extended cooler mesophilic range so that we can really do that slow decomposition of like more resistant materials often found in woody materials. Next slide, please. And this is that another one of those, but this is showing the four phase so that after we cool down, we are in that low temperature curing phase that you need to um, be patient with so that you can make sure that everything is broken down as much as possible. Next slide. So what is doing the breaking down during these phases? Primarily the bacteria is at play and bacteria are the smallest organisms and the most numerous in compost. So in one gram of compost, there are billions of microorganisms and bacteria make up about 80 to 90% of that. And they are the ones that are responsible for most of the decomposition. And as they decompose, they break down the materials using different enzymes. And this process creates heat. 
So that's what causes it to heat up more and more. And bacteria is such a wide array of organisms and they're very diverse. So there are many different ones at play that break down different um, proteins, different organic matter, and they use all kinds of different enzymes to do that. Next slide. So at the very beginning, if you remember that initial stage, before we start to heat up at all, we see psychrophiles, excuse me, and these are the early colonizers. So they're there and they like temperature around 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So not too much heat at all. And they slowly, they produce a little bit of heat, but really once it starts to heat up around um, the 70 degree Fahrenheit range, that's when the mesophiles are at work and they're the ones that are the real workers. They break down a lot of that material and they're in that mesophilic range that was that steep temperature increase. They thrive um, at temperatures from 70 to 90. And however, if it's below that, or if it's uh, above that range, you know, 90 to 110, they can survive, but it barely. And so that's, as it starts to heat up more and more because they're doing their job, they'll slowly start to die away. And that is when the thermophiles come in. So thermophiles, direct translation there, heat loving, right? So they're the ones that are at the top of that peak and they work very fast and in prefer a temperature range of 104 to around 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is when you can see your compost pile usually turn that rapidly turn from a green color, um, green or tan color into more of a uniform brown color when they're at work at the peak of it. Next slide. Now, in addition to the bacteria that we just went over, there's another form of bacteria called and it is referred to unctinimacitis. Unc it's a it's a mouthful, and yeah, it's it looks. Here's a picture of it. It actually looks like it's a fungi, but it is another class of bacteria. But it's a filamentous bacteria, and it creates a grayish cobweb. So if you've seen composting, you've probably seen this before. The reason why these organisms are so important is because they break down very hard to break down materials that are byproducts from wood, such as lignin and some cellulose. And it's also, if you think of compost, you can probably almost imagine that earthy characteristic smell that it has. And these organisms are what's um, uh, responsible for that. They're the ones that create that scent. And they appear during the thermophilic and then the cooling stages. So remember during that cooling stage, that's where we have that long extended period of time for them to break down the lignin and other harder to break down materials. And these bacteria are the ones that's responsible for that. Next slide. So the pile starts to cool down and that is when our non-microbial players can then start to move in. So up until now, we've been mostly working with bacteria and now we see fungi, nematodes, you know, mites, springtails, centipedes, sow bugs, ground beetles, all of these then, these larger macroorganisms then can then move in. Next slide. And then in addition, when the pile finally reaches a cooling stage, that's when we'll see earthworms. People who are um, new to composting, they initially just think about the earthworms at play, but it's so important to recognize all the different microorganisms that lead up to this point. And they're critical though in processing that organic matter because as they're processing it, they're creating those channels they're tunneling and that helps to process it, but also helps to aerate it, which Ava went over just how important it is that we have our compost aerated. And so they're naturally aerating it. In addition to you, if you're turning it or if you have an aeration um, turner barrel. All right, next slide, Ava. So we have, there is different um, composting methods um, and like one of them is what is called like the cold or slow um, composting and it's, it's like it is, it's just a slow composting bean. So it will be something that you have in a corner that is like a cheap composting. So it's like layers over layers, trench, a cool bin. So it's probably in the shade. Um, so it, it will not get the, the, the high temperatures. And these will, it will be more like um, aeration, you know, so they create the, the natural aeration and it will take longer. 
Um, so you need to make sure if you decide to do one of these at home and you're putting um, kitchen waste, uh, you need to be aware that you will be sharing um, some of that with wildlife and maybe some other friends that will come to that compost. The most popular probably ones and the fastest ones are the hot or fast composting, um, but they need to be a minimum of one cubic yard of material, so three uh, plus three plus three, so it has to be in at least that that big or small, depending how you think about it. Um, it has to be a good blend of greens and brown. Um, it has to have the proper moist content and you have to provide that aeration constantly, okay? And the, the particles that you put in there cannot should not be more than two to three inches um, uh, size. So you need to make sure um, and these composts will um, get hot um, and, and you will see the steam. Um, years, years ago, um, and if you've been living um, in Florida long enough, um, you remember the Mickey Mock that people used to go to Disney and get um, their compost. And I used to work at Disney Horticulture and you will drive by that pile and you will see the, the heat coming out of, of the pile. And sometimes depending on the demand when they give it out it's the same at the county compost um here in bus road sometimes you go and get it and still steaming so that means still cooking it's not a hundred percent um ready um so there is something that, that you need to keep in mind if you if you have one at home so you can do your own um pile and you know there is different ways to do it but we will talk about um two is one of is the sandwich le uh, method that is that you just put layers on top and, and on another and you combine you know it's the greens the brown and they're at least uh, three to four inches layer and you water you know while you're building that you let it there and it will happen okay um, the end, the last layer should be a brown layer. Um, some people will do something similar to underground, but you know, it's just you leave it there and that's it and it will it will do their process. And then the mix um, mix it method is that you put it and then you have to, you know, you have to mix everything. Um, so it, it depends how organized or how you're working in your garden that you can do your 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 style your your type of compost or your type of pile so here is an example of the san sandwich methods um so if you look you know you have your your layers of browns and greens um and it will be it will distribute the moisture and also it will filter the odors um if you ever drive through that disney pile or any place that they're doing um some of those big big compost it does smell I can tell you that. Um, okay, so the mixing methods, it will be probably something that I will do. It's all together and, you know, you should not um, add big pieces. You water, you move, and you keep adding more material, you know, and every time you add something, you keep moving that pile. So if you're adding more, if you keep working in your garden like this summer, that we go to the garden and keep um, doing some pruning or, or doing any maintenance that we have to do is bury the new material into the pile. Okay, so don't put it on top because that it starts the process again. So you want to make sure it's very and mix um, and it start a new pile, you know, in a different section of your area, just in case, you know, to make sure that you have some of your compost is already, it will get ready when you need it in a few months um, when you're ready to do your garden. And, you know, your new materials can be the micro um, food base. So you need to make sure you are adding that there. You need to monitor your pile, you know, the smell, um, especially if you live in a traditional um, homeowners um, or traditional neighborhood, your, your neighbors are going to not, they're not going to be happy. So um, you need to make sure you turn it to avoid others. Um, you also have to check for moisture, and we talked about that earlier, um, to make sure is is building. And you need to make sure you check the temperature, okay? So you can go, like, probably if you go this, this 
last few days and you have a compost pile, it's probably way over 140 degrees because it's just been really hot the last few days. Um, but you need to monitor. Like everything else in the garden, that's, that's one of the things I try to preach the most around here in, in our plant clinic and our classes. You need to monitor. You know, you need to go and look and, and see what is going on. So also you need to turn, you know, to reheat. When you're turning, you're, you're helping with the temperatures. You're adding um, oxygens, oxygens, oxygen, oxygen, um, oxygen destroying in the cerebral. So things that you don't want there that they need to break down, um, you're going to break the clumps and layers. So that's why it's, it's important. And then to keep the smell down, that's, that's very important. Um, you should... Um, you should, one of the questions is where should I place your, you know, the compost or your pile? You know, it should be in the shade or whatever you feel comfortable working, you know. Um, again, take make take in consideration your neighbors or, you know, if it's close to a window, do I really want that there? Um, one of the things that you need to make sure is close to water source just in case, okay? So when it's ready, well, when it's ready, sometimes um, you still have some um, clumps, so you can kind of um, use, I completely forgot what is the name of that, but you can use something to kind of keep the big pieces of your compost out and then just use the smaller pieces. Um, so when it's almost ready, do not add any more material. The earthworms are, earthworms are already um, assisting at this time. And sometimes it can take up to a year to have a compost that is ready, okay? Um, we used to have a compost pile here in the garden, and some um, sometimes it will take up to a year. It's depending on, on the year, you know, how much rain we had and, and how was the winter. Um, and then screen to remove the large chunks, okay? You don't want those. You may want to put those back in the, um, in the compost pile. Um, you can compost with worms, um, get a container, make sure you put some newspaper and add water. You can add the worms and bury the food scraps. So you don't want to put them on top, you want to mix them with the compost. One thing I will tell you, if it's too cold or it's too hot, the worms will try to escape and they will die. Okay, so you need to make sure, you know, if you have it in a spot, and it's during the winter that you move it to a, a little warmer spot during the winter. And if it's in the summer, make sure it's not extremely hot um, because they will they will try to escape and they will die. Which ones are the best worms? It will be the, the red wiggles or the African night crawlers. Um, and two pounds of worm will eat one pound of kitchen scrap a day. So that's just a fun fact for you. Compost uses, why we have, why we want compost, because it's a soil amendment, okay, it will increase the organic uh, matter in the compost, um, it will give our sandy soils a little more of um, body to hold moisture, um, it helps break up um, clay, and so it will drain better, also we can use it as a mulch, and, and also as a potting mix, so um, you can use it for your vegetable garden, for your your potted plants. Um, so it has many uses. Here is um, some examples of what is available um, commercially. Okay, um, I've been I've been looking for one myself. Um, something that I can put um, somewhere in my porch or in the backyard. And they can be from 80, from 40 to 100. But actually, when I was looking, maybe because everybody decided to be a gardener during um, these few, last few months, that they can be up to like $200, OK? So they're plastic, or they come in different materials. Um, you, they're available in a lot of different places. I have even seen them in Whole Food or um, Home Depot or different places, and I'm not endorsing any of the companies, but you can also order them online. Um, there's different companies. Most of the time, they're very easy to put together, and, you know, some of them are very easy to move, 
okay? Um, the one in the middle, the green one, if you see that little door, um, that one is really cool because when, it's re when the compost is ready, you can keep adding stuff on the top. And then you only pull that little door that is there, and then you take the compost that is ready. You use it, and then you cover, and then leave it there. Okay, so that one is really cool. Um, and then you can also build your own. You know, if you're like, okay, I'm not sure if I want to invest in all this. I want to start little by little. Um, you know, you can start with a um, like uh, one of these barrels. Just make sure you put some holes that there's not so much water holding and then it helps also with the aeration and then you can turn it so you can move it and and have the the compost in there you can do one with like chicken wire just make sure you move that you know at least once a week or you can do it with blocks and just do like three piles and you can move the different um as the compost is progressing you can move it um, remember that the minimum size should be three, um, three, three, three. Okay, so that's the minimum size that you should have it. Make sure that if you have, if you're thinking about building um, a compost, and I said this in every single class that I teach, um, if you live in a homeowner association, make sure that you follow the the rules for your homeowner association. You don't get in trouble. Okay. Um, but as, as lo most of the association, even if you don't have a fence, as long as they don't see it from the street, you will be fine. Um, and make sure, you know, they, if you live close to a neighbor, you're respectful. And, you know, if you smell, make sure you're moving it, that it's closed. There, there is no wildlife getting in there. And I'll tell you another story. My mom had a, a she lives in a, in a homeowner area and she was having some wildlife um, visitors and I told her what you've been putting in your pile so she was putting stuff in her pile so she had to stop and then find another way to compost that it was you know close and then the wildlife went away um, so that is one thing that you need to be careful um, depending on where you live and how much you are willing to compromise with the wildlife that's what we have I know it's a very um, Simple class on composting. Oh, did I lose you? No. Valerie, do we have any questions? I don't know if I can answer them, but I'll try. You. There is a lot of controversy about that. Um, some people, um, if you ask different agents, depending on which one you go, <laughs> they will tell you different things. I know they take a little longer to break. Um, what people um, suggest sometimes is that you put them in a blender, break it down, and then add it to the compost. Some other agents will tell you not even worry about it. But I will say why not to try. Okay, and if they don't know, we are here in Osceola County, and if they have any other questions, Valerie, I don't know if you can, um, we should have add our emails there, we forgot, but they can call us, and even the, our offices are not completely open to the public, but we can see people by appointments, or they can call us at 321-697-3000. If they have any questions and also we will be doing some other classes and I will take this opportunity to share that we will be doing the Florida Friendly Landscaping 9 um, Principal Series starting next week. Um, if you have, we are doing it in English and Spanish. So if you have any Spanish speaker friends, invite them. We're also going to be doing the uh, full vegetable gardening classes. And the three giveaway, and from our list of trees, we get a, at least different, like 10 to 15 species, and half of them, most of the time, are native because that's my compromise. So if you want some of the native trees, uh, make sure you register to attend to the class. I have to give out a lot of trees in August. Um, and I know Krista is also doing some classes. I don't know if you want to promote any of your classes. 
Um, right now, I just finished up one um, Florida Master Naturalist course. So I just wanted to say that if you guys are interested or if you didn't know, they're currently doing Master Naturalist courses online. So if it's difficult for you to get to in-person classes, this might be a great opportunity to check out a new Master Naturalist course. And um, stay tuned because I will be uh, planning a couple more of those for the coming year. Yep. Thank you for the invitation. And we are here um, if you guys have any questions now or later. Thank you all. Thanks Thank for having you. Me. Bye.